This is Coding Math, episode 57, Grid Layout. So let's continue on the subject of layout math, this time looking at grids. A grid is basically a layout consisting of cells arranged in rows and columns. When we covered the box layout in episode 56, we did wind up having multiple rows of items, but there was no concept of columns there. Now, when we get into the size of each cell, we have a couple of options. One is to make all the cells a uniform size and then adjust whatever content goes into the cells so that it fits into that area. This is usually what we think of when we talk about a grid. The other option is to have the size of the content determine the size of the cells. In this case, the widest item in each column would determine the width of that column, and the tallest item in each row would determine the height of that row. That's a bit more complex, and it's probably more what you'd call something like a table layout. We'll leave that for another day and focus on uniform grids today. Now, when laying out a uniform grid, there are three factors. The size of each cell, its width and height. The number of rows and columns in the grid. And the overall size of the grid itself, its width and height. You get to choose any two of these, and the third one is determined for you. For example, if you know you have a 200 by 200 area to draw your grid, and you want five rows and five columns, then you know each cell will be 40 by 40. Or if you want your cells to be, say, 20 by 20, and you want six rows and six columns, then your overall grid is going to wind up at 120 by 120. And finally, if you have a 200 by 200 grid, and you want your cells to be 50 by 50, then you can work out that you're going to have four rows and four columns. Note that in this last one, you could wind up with a fractional number of rows or columns, so we'll have to figure out what to do about that. To start, though, let's decide on a grid size and a number of rows and columns. Here I have a canvas set up in the document, and I'm setting the width and height via code. Again, I'm filling the canvas with gray so I can see the bounds, and then switching the fill color to black so we can see the content that we draw. Now at this point, the canvas is 600 by 600. Now let's decide that we want 10 rows and 10 columns. I'll make a variable for each of those. Now we need to know the width and the height of each cell. That's simple division. We say cell width equals width divided by calls, and cell height equals height divided by rows. And now we're all set to draw our grid. I'm going to set up a double loop here. The outer loop will have a variable i that goes from zero to rows. And the inner loop will have a variable called j going from zero to calls. Now we can figure out the xy position of each cell by multiplying j by cell width and i by cell height. But here we can make things much simpler for our drawing code by using canvas transformations. I'll start by saving the current state of the context. Then I'll translate by j times cell width on the x-axis and i times cell height on the y-axis. Then I'll leave some space for the drawing code itself and finally call context restore to do the transformation. Now for each cell, the canvas coordinates have been translated so that the origin is at the top left corner of each cell. So rather than worrying about where you are on the canvas, you can just consider that you have a mini canvas that is cell width by cell height in size. So let's draw a rectangle there. We'll want some padding, so I'll say fill rect 5, 5, cell width minus 10, cell height minus 10. That'll give it a 5 pixel padding on each side. And there's our grid. Very nice. Now let's see how flexible this is. I can change the columns to 5. And note how the cell size changed. Same with the rows. Now I can change the actual width of the canvas. Note that we still have five rows and five columns. The width of each column has changed to accommodate the new size. And we can do the same thing with the height of the canvas. And I'll just restore everything to how it was originally. Now let's take one of the other options. Say we know the size of the cells we want and how many of them we'll need to determine how big our canvas should be to fit all that. So we start up top by defining what we know, cell width and cell height, say 50 by 50, and rows and columns, let's say 10 by 10. 
Now we can figure out the overall width and height and assign that to the canvas. Now when we run this, we see that our canvas has shrunk to 500 by 500 in size. If we make the cells bigger, the canvas gets bigger. Or if we change the number of rows and columns, the canvas grows or shrinks to fit what it needs to. Note that we didn't have to change any of the grid drawing code at all. That just needs to know how many rows, columns, and the size of each cell. Now finally the last option. You know the size of the grid and the size of each cell. How many rows and columns do we need? We'll go back to setting the canvas size manually. And we'll set cell width and cell height. In this case, calls is width divided by cell width, and rows is height divided by cell height. And that works fine for the numbers we're using right now. But what if we set cell width and cell height to 70? Now 600 divided by 70 is 8.57 something. And that's just what we get. Eight columns and part of another column, eight rows and part of another row. The best we can really do here is round down the row and column count. We can do this by wrapping those calculations in a call to math floor. Now this leaves you with some extra space, but at least you can see all the cells. You could get fancy and add some padding to the top and left to center the whole thing. Or once you've calculated the number of rows and columns, you could go back and adjust the cell size or canvas size to make things fit better. I'll leave those options for you to explore if you run into that situation. For now, I'm going to go back to the very first configuration, where we know the canvas size and the row and column count. Now, so far we've just been drawing rectangles, but we can draw whatever we want in here. Again, just imagine you have a mini canvas that is the size of a single cell. Here I'll begin a path and loop through 50 times. In each iteration, I'll call context line 2, passing in a random number from 0 to cell width on X and 0 to cell height on Y. And we'll finish up by calling stroke. Now we have a grid full of random scribbles. Let's try drawing circles. For each cell, I'll begin a path, then draw an arc. The arcs XY will be the center of the cell, cell width divided by 2, and cell height divided by 2. For the radius, at this point we can choose either half the cell width or half the cell height, as they're both the same. But really it should be the minimum of those two values in case we get non-square cells. I can actually pre-calculate this because it's not ever going to change within the loop. I'll just go up here and say radius equals math min, cell width, cell height, all divided by 2. Then I can use that radius in the arc call with 0 and math pi times 2 to make a full circle, and follow it up with a call to fill. Now we have a grid of circles. We could add some padding in there by saying radius minus 5 if we want. Okay, we don't have to draw the same exact thing in every cell. We can vary it dynamically based on its row and column if we want. For example, I can make a variable s here and set it to math sine j. That'll result in a value that oscillates from minus 1 to plus 1 as we move left to right. If I multiply that by 0 0.5, I'll get values from minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5. Finally, if I add 0 0.5 to that, the result will run between 0 and 1. Now down in the arc statement, instead of just a static radius, I can say radius times s. Now as the circles go from left to right, they cycle from 0 to the full possible radius. If I increase the row and column count to 50, we get multiple bands of size changes. Now I can mess with the values of here a bit. If I change this to 0 0.25 and this to 0 0.75, I'll get values from 0 0.5 to 1. So the circles never get too small. Then if I add i to the mix in here, the circles vary on both the x and y axes, resulting in a diagonal banding. I'm just randomly experimenting here, so I'll try multiplying i and j instead of adding them. Well, that was unexpected. Can uh, zoom in a bit here by multiplying by a fraction, say 0.25. Crazy. 
At this point, it's not even recognizable as a grid, but that's what it is. Anyway, you can now see that grids can be a very practical way of laying out visual elements, or they can be leveraged to create some crazy op art, or just about anything in between. And it's surprising how simple it all really is.